Hi, thank you so much for being here. So today we are gonna talk about one of the most common surgeries that women go through that isn't actually talked about all that much. So many of you know, if you are familiar with my channel, my personal history with endometriosis and with prolapse and going through IVF and many of these issues. I'm 42 years old now and I was first diagnosed with endometriosis in 2005. And so I have had a long journey with many um, laparoscopy and surgeries for that and many rounds of IVF and those kind of things. So three months ago in November of 2019, I had my most extensive surgery to date and fingers crossed, hopefully my last. So I had three pelvic floor repairs for my prolapse, I had more endometriosis excision, and I had a hysterectomy. And so I wanted to come and talk about it because I feel personally that, again, with this, especially with the hysterectomy being such a common surgery, there actually isn't all that much information out there about it. And there's definitely not a lot of information out there about prolapse repair. So I feel like I wanna put my journey out there to make sure that anyone else going through it or considering the surgery has the information they need, that they can be their own advocate and make a decision for themselves and know how to recover and also just really know that they aren't alone. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about the surgeries that I personally had and then I can talk to you about my own personal recovery over the last three months. So I went in and I'm gonna tell you exactly what I had done. So I had a bladder prolapse, it's called a cystocele had a rect seal and I had a uterine prolapse. And so there's a lot leading up to that as well. If you're sitting there thinking, I don't know if I have a prolapse, but I might. It's again, actually very common. So mine occurred after our first daughter was born. I had a 43 hour labor, four hours of that was pushing and then a vacuum <laughs> was used to get her out. So all of those things were the perfect storm that I was the prime candidate for a prolapse, which I didn't even know at the time. And again, I went through a seven year journey of dealing with my prolapse, um, knowing that I wanted more kids. So surgery was not even on my radar at all during that time, at all. And so that's what I was dealing with. So finally I got done nursing our second baby. And I would say I felt limited in the fact if you aren't sure if you have a prolapse, you're gonna feel possibly a lot of pressure. You might even see something hanging out of your vagina. That is a key sign that you have a prolapse. Um, frequent urination, incontinence, pain, those kind of things, okay? So I was really lucky I didn't have incontinence. Um, my main thing was actually a bulge. I had that very constantly. I was not running at all, but I had found a way to manage it. Every single one of my videos that you see here, I didn't even start my YouTube channel till after my daughter was born. So every single video that is on this channel and in my unlimited program, they were all filmed while I had a prolapse. So it's very manageable. So I wanna throw that out there first. So again, surgery wasn't really on my radar. That being said, I, again, having the endometriosis that I have, I had been told numerous times that a hysterectomy might be a good option for me. Again, that was not on my radar. It's not anything that I wanted to even talk about or deal with. So I got done nursing my second baby, our two-year-old boy, and I knew it was probably time just to get things assessed, really, because I knew we were done with kids. Um, and again, that's another thing I'm gonna throw out for anyone dealing with the hysterectomy piece. There is a lot of mental things that you need to sift through. That's what I had to do. This was a long time coming for me. I had to go through a really big mourning period personally to get ready for a hysterectomy. I had to go through a big mourning period accepting we weren't gonna have more kids. That was hard for me, um, even though I knew it was right for our family and that medically, really, it wasn't gonna happen anyway. But I'd always wanted three kids and so that was something I had to get through along with my age. So if you are considering a hysterectomy, Please don't be surprised at all if you're feeling a lot of feels about it. <clears throat> Take the time that you need to deal with that. I highly recommend seeing a therapist if you need to. You want to make sure you deal with all of that on the front end, right, instead of dealing with it on the back end. Okay, so I'll throw that out there. So I finally decided that I wanted to get things assessed and really know where I was and what I could expect going forward. Because knowing I was done with kids and done breastfeeding, I felt like I could really deal with the prolapse. Because one other tip now for prolapse 
if you are nursing, your hormones are so crazy that the prolapse isn't going to get a lot better until after you're done nursing. So just keep that in mind. Don't freak out and don't make any judgment calls while you're nursing. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, you guys. So don't make any judgment calls while you're nursing because you really don't know where your body's going to be until you're done nursing and your hormones regulate and you get some of that elastin back in your tissues. Okay, so keep that in mind. So I was done nursing and I went to see a urogynecologist. So that is my first big tip for you if you're wondering who to see and what to do. You can see your OB first. I did. I saw only my OB for seven years, but they are not experts in this field whatsoever, okay? So if you have any incontinence issues, any possible prolapse issues at all, go see a urogynecologist. They are gonna be able to do all the testing and tell you where you're at. It was actually fascinating to me and interesting that no one had recommended I do that until now. It took seven years for any doctor, anyone to say, you need to see a urogynecologist, all right? So keep that in mind. So I saw a urogynecologist and I saw two in the office and I was told where I thought I had a bladder prolapse. I actually had a bladder prolapse, a rectal prolapse, and a uterine prolapse. I didn't even know all these things I was dealing with, but no matter, I was no, it really makes sense why I was so uncomfortable. So these things were not going to get better. I had tried women's health PT numerous times. I'm a physical therapist myself and a women's health expert. I had done all the right things. I had done a pessary. If any of you are out there, that's definitely an option if you have prolapse. So I had done all of that <clears throat> and none of it was going to make me better. Mine was so bad. The level of it was so bad that those conservative things weren't going to make it better. So my options were just to deal with it, which I definitely could. I had been. I could keep dealing with it or have surgery right away, or wait and have surgery later. But the problem with waiting sometimes is that it can get worse and surgical repairs might be harder later on. Another thing to keep in mind, if you are fairly young and if you haven't gone through menopause yet, you have a better chance healing if you haven't gone through menopause yet. So just something to keep in mind because you're, again, your hormones are still there. You have estrogen, which makes your tissues very elastic and helps you heal a little more easily. And I know that's not always a personal choice, definitely. Okay, so I had the prolapse surgery on the table. And then along with that, I had the hysterectomy piece if they're already in there anyway, right? So I discussed that with my doctor and with my prolapses, the only way to fix a uterine prolapse is to take the uterus out. Um, so that's what they recommended for me. They recommended to fix the two prolapse the bladder and the rectal, so that's cystocele and rectocele. They recommended to repair those, to take out the uterus, and then also to put in mesh. And I'm not gonna say this word right, sacropoplexy. Actually, I think I did say that right, sacropoplexy. And what that does, if any of your doctors are recommending that for you, it is inserting mesh from your tailbone to your cervix or near your cervix to help keep the vagina and the vaginal wall lifted so that you don't, you have less chance of suffering prolapse again later on. Okay. So those were the major repairs I had done. And then I had a choice whether I wanted to keep both ovaries or take one out or take them both out. Um, so this is a very personal choice and I'm just going to lay it out for you. So you know how to make the choice for yourself. You at least have the information. If you have both ovaries removed, you wake up in menopause, basically. That's it. You need to go on hormone replacement therapy or address it in whatever way is personally best for you, but you will wake up from surgery in menopause and have to deal with that. Again, I'm 42. I didn't feel comfortable with that. I'm gonna tell you also, because I'm a research person, I'm in the medical field, there are a lot of studies out there Keep in mind that if you have that total hysterectomy with both ovaries out, your chances of heart disease and of Alzheimer's and various other things later in life are much higher, and that's tied to the hormones. So if you do have both ovaries out, I highly recommend you talking to your doctor about hormone replacement or at least about these studies and what you can do for your hormones. So I personally didn't want both out. But you can, my understanding and all the consults I did, you can keep one ovary and it takes over for both. So that is what I did. Um, a lot of people ask me how I picked which ovary. For me, strangely enough, it was easy. My endo pain has always been on one side. I mean, I've, I've had it on both, but it's always worse on one side. So that's the one I wanted out. So that's the one that I had taken out. Now I want to 
tell you about endometriosis. So if I did not have the prolapse whatsoever, I don't know if I would have had a hysterectomy to help with my endo pain, all right? So I'm gonna say that again. Research shows, the medical literature shows, the hysterectomy is not always the best way to deal with endometriosis and to because it is not always directly related to your endo pain, okay? Um, I have friends who have had hysterectomies because of endo and it has changed their life for the better. So keep that in mind. It very well might be the best decision for you. But let me tell you what happens. Your endo is related to the hormones being released in your body. So if you keep one ovary like I did, you need to go in with the understanding that you still have hormones. You still ovulate actually every single month. You still have those hormones going. So you can still, believe it or not, develop endometriosis and you can still get that scar tissue. So that's something my doctors talked to me about. I could have both ovaries removed and have a much higher chance of my endo pain going down, but be in menopause right away. Or I could keep one ovary, not be in menopause, but my endo pain might still be there. So that was the choice I made. I just like to give the information because like I said, I feel like it's not out there very much. So those are things you'll have to consider. But um, I will tell you from a recovery standpoint, I still have some of my endo pain. I still feel pain during that ovulation cycle. I don't know if it would have gone away if I had the other ovary taken out, but I will say I'm thankful I made this decision based on the prolapse and not simply on the hope that my endo pain would completely go away. Um, but like I said, I also have friends who've had the surgery and it's a life changer for them for the best. So, and my first laparoscopy was a life changer for my endo as well. I didn't need a hysterectomy. I just needed the laparoscopy. Okay, so that's what I had done. Oh, one other thing I wanna tell you that again, I had to do my own research and had to have a secondary consult on this is if you're having a hysterectomy, you need to talk to your doctor about whether they're gonna take your cervix out or not. So originally my doctor was gonna leave my cervix. Um, I talked to another um, woman who's a fabulous friend of mine and an OBGYN about this, and she asked if I've ever had an abnormal pap smear. And believe it or not, I have, I've had many, and I've even had procedures to remove precancerous cells. And she said, I'm sorry, you have to have your cervix out. It makes no sense for you to keep it because at this point it's just precancerous. So not really understanding this, basically if you keep your cervix, you are keeping some of those cells. So one, you can have breakthrough bleeding actually and still possibly have your period every month. And to me, if I'm having a hysterectomy, I might as well get all the benefits from it if I'm gonna have that surgery. I would really like to avoid any breakthrough bleeding, please. But two, you still have to have a pap smear um, regularly. And again, I thought, why would I do that? It's not giving me any benefits. So I talked to my doctor the week of surgery, I talked to him and he agreed and he took my cervix out and it gives me a huge peace of mind. I don't have to have pap smears. I don't have that cancer possibility because my cervix is gone. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind, okay? So that hopefully lays out for you what the surgeries kind of look like from a layman's perspective. So you know, again, I just want you to be an advocate for yourself. Go in understanding what might happen. Ask them exactly what they're going to do. I tell my patients, be the squeaky wheel. I mean, you need to ask. Do not let them leave that room until you've gotten your questions answered. Oh, one other thing you might be thinking is about a bladder sling. So you will have a urinary tests done to look at your bladder and whether you're clearing it correctly. And luckily my test showed I did not need a sling whatsoever. So I did not have that done, so I can't comment on that, but that is very common with a prolapse and you will have those tests done. So keep that in mind too. All right, so my recovery, it has been 12 weeks and depending on your doctor, but I think this is pretty common, my restrictions were for 10 weeks pelvic rest and pelvic rest is very similar to after you have a baby. So no taking a bath, no swimming, no sex for that amount of time because you're giving your pelvis a complete rest. And then the biggest one for me was actually no lifting more than 10 pounds for 10 weeks. And that's a big deal because I have a two year old. So that was the hardest part to be honest, just about from a restriction standpoint. We definitely, I had to have a lot of conversations. We had to do a lot of planning with my husband beforehand on how we were gonna work naps because I'm the one who takes him in. So my husband would actually come home from work every day at nap time to put him in his crib. 
because you have got to follow those restrictions. You have to, or you're taking the possibility that that scar tissue isn't gonna form and the prolapse repair isn't gonna work. So whatever restrictions they give you, follow them. So that was it for me for 10 weeks. Um, and then now I'm restriction free, but like I tell all of my clients, it's like having a baby. They tell you not to do anything for eight weeks and then you're allowed to do whatever you want. But really that doesn't make any sense because you've been doing nothing and you can hurt yourself if you suddenly jump into everything. You need a plan to ramp up. So that's where I am now. I'm I'm doing the ramp up. I'm still using 10 pounds actually in my workouts. I haven't gone above that yet. But I am lifting and carrying my baby, but I get tired. My muscles get tired, so I can't carry him quite as much as I was before, but I'm getting there. For me personally, <clears throat> the recovery was, believe it or not, in some ways much easier than my last laparoscopy. My last laparoscopy, I got bronchitis afterwards. I threw out my SI joint, I was in a lot of pain. It was really tough and it took six months to a year before I really was able to do some of my Pilates and abdominal movements. This time I'm already back to doing a good portion of Pilates. Somehow my abdominals recovered pretty fast, which I'm extremely thankful for. That being said, I feel like my pelvic floor has not. It feels extremely weak. It gets sore still. It's better every day, but it still gets very sore. Um, I don't like I said, it gets very tired if I carry my son for too long. So that's where I am right now to this day. When it comes to recovery, I would say you're definitely going to deal with soreness. Anesthesia is a lot. I still have this cough. You can actually hear it. You've probably heard me clear my throat. So the statistic I've heard that really makes sense to me is it takes about a month for your body to clear anesthesia and that's a month for every hour you were under. So I was under for four hours. So my body hasn't even cleared anesthesia. So you're going to feel foggy. You're going to feel confused. You're going to feel um, emotional and you're going to probably get a cough, that kind of stuff. That is all normal. Right afterwards, the surgery, you're going to wake up. I had to stay in the hospital overnight. Just follow all the directions, but it is hard. It's hard the first few weeks. Um, there's a lot of things involved as there is with any surgery. You're going to have constipation issues. You're going to have pain issues. You're going to have to work around your lifestyle and stairs and all of that kind of stuff. But I was back to work within probably three weeks. Um, and that for me is seeing clients. So I was in the office fine. I mean, I was taking care of my kids like normal. I had the help of my husband. I was showering the next day. So you can do all those things. I was driving within one or two weeks um, as soon as I was off the pain meds. Just drink a lot of water, do a lot of anti-inflammatory, have some simple foods around, let people cook for you, let people help you, don't come home. Like I did come home and I was making our bed the next day with clean sheets and I thought, why am I, I shouldn't be making our bed with clean sheets. Like that's, of course my husband would have done it if I asked and I just didn't ask, but I, I kind of stopped and thought, okay, Jessica, you need to take a moment and just rest. These are the things that you don't have to be doing that really might throw your body off. So that's the biggest thing is just making sure you take time to rest. But I also tell my clients and I keep telling myself, it takes a year, I believe, before all the dust settles from any surgery. So these are my ACL clients, total knees, rotator cuff repairs, back surgeries, all of that. It takes a year really before the dust settles and you know, this is where I am. So that's what I'm telling myself every day. I honestly get frustrated because I'm an overachiever and I just wanna move and I wanna be able to do what I wanna do and I still get soreness and it bothers me. Um, but I remind myself to take it slow. I don't know what the lasting results are gonna be yet. So don't feel like, I have to remind myself not to feel like I'm behind because I don't think I'm behind, but it's also knowing your body and those kind of things. So you know the right questions to ask and when you need to rest and when you actually need to move because movement is really important too, to get your blood flowing and get your digestion going. So I hope that helps someone out there to let you know that this is doable. It's very doable. It isn't fun. Surgery is not fun at all. And this one, especially the prolapse piece, is not fun. You will lose all modesty, but mine was gone anyway with the having babies and the amount of surgeries that I've had. So it's not fun, but it's very doable. And my hope is just that my lifestyle improves. And that's why I was willing to do it. I think I told you earlier that I had a choice. I could wait to do it, or I could just not do it and manage my lifestyle, or I could go ahead and do it and have it done. I took a lot of time to think about it. Um, I talked with my husband about it. 
I decided, we decided to do it now because one, we were in a place with our lifestyle that he could help a lot with the baby, um, our two year old. And so it was a good time for us. Like it was before the holidays, I could easily take six to eight weeks off. So that was some of it. It was a really good time for us to do it. Also, I was told again, I could wait, but it's possible it would get worse and then surgical repair was harder and I didn't wanna take that chance. Some of it was peace of mind, to be honest, that just getting, it was very hard for me mentally to mourn that and accept that I wouldn't have that part of me anymore. This is a part of me that gave me both of my babies. Um, this is a part that can make us feel like we're a woman and there's a lot tied to that. So that was hard for me at the same time knowing what mine had been through in the past and knowing the disease that was in it, it gave me some peace of mind knowing I could be done and do what was right for my body and do what was right for that part of me and move forward with a fresh slate. So I did that. And also just the hope that with the prolapse, it would improve my lifestyle, that I could possibly maybe run again. You guys, I don't even love to run necessarily, but I would love to be able to have the choice to do it or not. And that's what I haven't had for seven years. So something like that, doing squats without feeling like I have to stop because it's sore. Um, having more confidence in my body. Um, if you are going through a prolapse, you know you can lose some confidence. So that was important to me. So all of those things made me decide that I felt like now was the right time and that I could come out of it an even stronger person than I was before. And that's what I hope for you and that you really believe it, that you take from this, that you are your own advocate, go look things up. And I don't mean the forums, you guys. I would honestly stay out of the forums, to be honest. They weren't helpful for me. They can be very negative. The people who are talking in forums are typically the ones who haven't been through it yet or who went through it and had really bad results. So forums weren't helpful to me. What's helpful for me is finding people who are honest with their information, possibly blogs who have actually been through it, but really some medical studies too, um, so that I can know the kind of questions I should be asking. So do some of your research, but do that. Like go to Mayo Clinic, go to some of those places and just find out what procedures they're doing and what your restrictions might be. A lot of that is online to find. So do your research, be your own advocate, ask questions, get second opinions if you need it, talk to your family and make sure they're supporting you, talk to your work if you need to and make sure it's a good time to take off and then just believe in yourself and that you're worth it, that you can do it, whether you make the decision to do it or not to do it. And if you're in the place you've been through it, please know, I feel you, I understand. I think there's hope on this side of it, I really do. Um, and I would love to hear any comments or questions that you have below. Thank you for being here and then stay tuned because coming up in the next few weeks, I am gonna be posting a few exercise videos on what I have been doing after my hysterectomy. So what helped me, I feel like, recover a little bit that were within the restrictions. And then also some things that I recommend not doing if you have a prolapse. So I do have a video here on YouTube for exercises for prolapse, but I wanna let you know some things that you shouldn't be doing as well. So look out for those and I'll see you soon. Thanks so much for stopping by. Remember, subscribe to my channel and you'll be notified every time a new video comes up. Like and comment on this video and let me know what you thought. You can also always come over to jessicavalantpilates.com to find all the resources I have for living a healthy lifestyle, including full-length workout videos, healthy recipes, and a community I would love for you to be a part of. So I'll see you there.